Hello, everybody. Welcome to part five of our reading of the Magdalene series. I think today we're actually going to complete all of the channeled stuff, allegedly channeled stuff from Mary Magdalene. And then next week, we'll start in the next section of the book, which actually goes through a lot of the practices that come from this priestesshood of Isis and the alchemies of Horus. Now, before we get started, uh, last week, I did have a question from a subscriber that was asking me about how to get into deep backbending, because I did speak about some of the physical experiences I've had with very deep backbending. And I was going to respond with a comment, but it was a little too much for me to write. So I'm going to put this here on the video. With deep backbending, you absolutely need to have a teacher. And it could take you many, many, many years to actually get into a deep backbend. When we think about moving the body, one of the biggest mistakes a lot of people make, especially if they're new to something like the practice of yoga, is they immediately grasp for this idea of flexibility. And that's kind of um, an illusion, all right? We're not really looking for flexibility. If you ever have a yoga teacher that tells you to get more flexible, then you need to go to a different teacher. You will have teachers tell you to get stronger. And so if we think about that in relationship to how the body moves, an active body, I, I tell my students this all the time, an active body is an activated body, right? And so when we passively stretch, we're going to injure ourselves. When we actively stretch, we're not, we're going to be less likely to injure ourselves. And so, especially in the idea of deep back bending, in order to hold a deep back bend, you have to be physically strong. Your muscles have to be very toned. They have to be very, very alive. You look at uh, dancers, you look at figure skaters, gymnastics, all these people who do deep back bends like we do in yoga. They're all very physically strong and very physically fit people. Within the muscle tissue, within the fascia, there's energy. This is where the nadis, we talk about the pathways of energy, run, all right? And just like your blood runs through the body. So when we're doing these, these back bends or any type of shape we're making with our body, if our muscles are not activated, not only are we more likely to hurt ourselves, but our, in, our energy is still stagnant. And so that's why there needs to be strength. That's why a lot of times with these old spiritual religions and practices and faiths, there was a lot of physical exercise involved. It's because the body is the temple. And within these muscles lies information that's being pulled through the channels of the body. Now, I will tell you, as a teacher, when a student comes into my Mysore room with a super flexible back or super flexible in general, I get scared. I would rather have a student that's super tight come into my Mysore room than one that's super flexible. The people who are super flexible naturally are the ones who are most likely going to get injured because they're used to achieving this shape without actually incorporating modality. All right, where the ones who are tighter usually tend to have more strength anyway, so it's easier to work with that instead of someone who's just loosey goosey and doesn't have any control over their own body. And so again, to, in order to achieve a very deep back bend, especially for the spiritual purposes, you absolutely need to have a teacher. And I'm not talking about just dropping into yoga classes here and there. I'm talking about an actual teacher, someone that you work with every single day and only work with every single day. There is a saying in India, many doctors, many wives, many teachers, certain death. Okay, so just one teacher, pick a teacher and work with that teacher. That teacher needs to get to know your body, get to know your patterns, your habits, all that kind of stuff, and can slowly help you work into this type of opening. It's not going to happen overnight. It's probably going to take many, many years, but it's totally worth it. All right, so with that being said, if you have not seen the previous parts to this series, I will place them down in the description box below. You most likely want to start with those parts first before coming into part five. Today with part five, we're going to be starting with section 20. I wish to now reveal some of the secrets of the magic of Isis. As I said earlier, it is possible to scale the height of consciousness alone without a partnership. And in this, the alchemies of Horus were des designed to assist the initiate. Yeah, absolutely. We've covered that. You can do this by yourself as well, but you can also do this with a partner. All right. However, those in partnership, sacred relationships, 
the sex magic of Isis was revealed. There are several aspects to this I wish to discuss. So again, she referred to this as a sacred relationship, so not just some person you picked up at the bar, but an actual sacred union between a divine feminine and a divine masculine. The first of these is understanding that at the moment of orgasm, magnetic fields are generated. In truth, these fields are created through what you would call foreplay, the stimulation of the senses through touch. This sensory stimulation begins the process of building the magnetic fields and is crucial to the alchemical practice of this magic. There are several methods available to initiates, and I will discuss some of these, but essentially to the practice is understanding of the nature of the interaction of the two alchem alchemical elements within the man and the woman. On a mundane level, the semen of the man carries the information of his genetic lineage, which is passed on to the child. When the sperm within his semen joins the egg of the woman, life is created, and life is complex interconnection of magnetic fields. The growing child within the womb develops organs and systems, but at the magnetic level, these can be viewed as interconnecting complex vibrational and magnetic fields. And so at the mundane level, the act of sex creates new patterns of magnetics. And that is absolutely true. So I've said this before, when a baby is made, let's take the man, for example, whatever vibrational frequency the man has at that time, that is coming from his body and going into the egg to then create the child. This is why children have a, a karma that they carry from their ancestors. And so in an ideal world, we would all work on ourselves before we have children so that we're not passing that crap down to our children. Because once it hits the children, once you are a human being created, even though you picked up this karma from your dad or your mom or whatever, it's now yours. It, you can't like just project it back onto them. It's now yours to deal with. And so uh, Guruji used to say, so we have six different series in the Ashtanga system. And right now there's only one person living that's completed all six series. And that's my teacher over in India. It's almost impossible. It's extremely hard to finish all six series. But we always laugh and say that the seventh series is the home life, is you know being a parent or a spouse or whatever that may be. And Guruji used to say that you couldn't do seventh series until you completed all six series. You weren't ready for seventh series for home life for having children until you had completed all the six series before. And I think there's some truth to that, even though that's not possible because if that were the case, then there would be no humans because very few people have been able to complete that much work. But um, there is some truth to that where you need to actually work on yourself in a lot, in the best case scenario before having a child so that you are pass passing on the best, the best vibrational frequency you can to your child. All right. Initiates trained in alchemy use the sexual energy to, to also create complex magnetic fields, but these fields do not become a new being, a child. They become incorporated into the Ka body of the two initiates themselves, strengthening and elevating their Ka body. This is the first essential point to understand. Everything revolves around this. The task of the initiate within the system that Yahshua and I were trained and is to strengthen the ka body beyond the confines of the physical form or the cut. The next level of understanding has to do with the emotional tuning of the female initiate. For the female's initiation is dependent upon her emotional state. This is part of her nature and cannot be sidestepped if these techniques are to work. We talked about this last week, 100%. 100% I can say that... Um, you have to be able to completely trust. And a lot of women, myself included, have trauma and have stress around this. And so the emotional state of the woman is very, 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 very important. And it, it I mean, obviously she's the one that has somebody like literally in, inside of her body. And so there needs to be stability with her. So again, men, if you want to do this with your wives or girlfriends, just make sure that they're emotionally okay. Get them be be the man that you need that she needs for you to be in order for her to be able to let go and trust you all right essential to the female initiate is the authentic feeling of safety and love or appreciation at the very least 
When these are in place, something within her being lets go and allows the alchemy to occur. The alchemy is created by the joining of the male's initiates ka and the female initiates ka. As they make love, the ka bodies interconnect, and this causes the female to open her magnetic floor. This is a strange term. It comes from the language used in the temple of Isis. The floor is the foundation upon which one stands. When we set something to be secure, we place it on the floor. So the floor was used as a type of slang within the temples, referring to the very basic piece that is required. When I say the female's magnetic floor, I am saying that this is the fundamental feast piece that has to occur. As the two initiates continue in their love making, and as the passion of their connecting increases, the powerful chemicals are released in the brain and in the body. These transport the initiates into another space than their normal ways of being. This further opens the magnetic fields and generates an increase in the magnetics. There are two options to the male initiate at the moment of orgasm. He can ejaculate or hold his seed. If he ejaculates and the previous conditions have been met, there is an, an instantaneous reaction that occurs within the womb of the female. As the energetic essence of his sperm strikes the wall of her inner san sanctum, there is an explosion of magnetic energy, worlds within worlds spinning. And to the extent that the male initiate has attained a high status as well as the female, the magnetics, magnetics released from such contact between such sexual fluids can be enormous. So it's important to understand that this creates complex magnetics that both the male and the female can draw into their bodies. The second phenomenon occurs in which the female initiate may begin to shake uncontrollably. As she shakes, the center of it is usually the womb itself, which sets off a cascade, a rocking effect in the pelvis. This action also creates very complex magnetic fields again, which the male and female initiate can draw into their ka bodies. This is the fundamental or basic understanding. As initiates, it is possible to also cause the serpent powers to rise within the spine during the sex act and wherever the two serpents meet will tend to magnetize that chakra and its attendant abilities of power. More than this, I am not permitted to say since the attainment of this practice can lead to a significant increase in one's powers. I leave it to those who read this to see between the lines. If you're ready for this practice, you will know how it is done. I get that because even in the yoga sutras, like the third and the fourth pada of the yoga sutras, we're told we're not supposed to study until like 10 years after we started our practice because it goes over the siddhis or the yogic powers. And it is a fear amongst a lot of the yoga teachers of the past and of the present that people will misuse these siddhis versus actually use them for good, which I think we can attest to has happened in a lot of cases as far as the other side of this, um, this world we're living in the dark side where they have manipulated a lot of the stuff that's used by the light to, for negative purposes. So I think that makes sense to you guys. All right. 21 in the training of both the sex magic of Isis and alchemies of Horus initiates would be trained in the basic exercises of the two serpents. In this practice, the initiate alone generates energy to the power of raw or the internal fire to create an elevation in awareness, to, to create complex magnetic fields within his or her own body, and then to bring these into the ka or the light body. I wish to share this method. In this core practice, for those who wish to do this is work alone, and for those who wish to do this is work in partnership. The fundamental practice requires that the initiate sit upright, breathing in a rhythmic, calm manner. Pranayama, breathing exercises. Then the initiate becomes aware of the base of the spine and on the breath draws the black serpent rising from the left and the gold serpent rising from the right up the spine. As the two serpents enter each chakra, they cross over, making their way up to the crown. But in this practice, the two serpents are brought up to the center of the head to the vicinity of the pineal gland. The initiate then uses the power of the breath sends the energy of the inhales into the serpent and then with the exhale sends the energy of breath deeper into the serpent's bodies, causing to be, them to become alive, so to speak. Eventually, they will move from the power of the breath and the in initiation of the initiate. 
At this point, a chalice is imagined inside the head of the two serpents facing off each other at the lip, the pineal gland resting at the bottom of the chalice. The next phase draws the energy of Ra upward. The initiate imagines a living ball of fire like the sun at the solar plexus. And with each exhale, the initiate silently re repeats or intones the sound of Ra. This causes the light, the fire of the internal Ra to be activated and it spontaneously begins to move up. So yes, again, the solar plexus are that third chakra. That's where a lot of heat is at. That's your Helios. That's your sun. And I've actually done these breathing exercises. I know exactly the breathing exercise that she's speaking about here. I've done this before in pranayama classes many, many, many times. Moving the breath literally up and down the spine. It's actually quite difficult to do. It will cause you to sweat a lot. Um, and, and then holding it at each particular places along the spine. With pranayama, one thing I will suggest too is you got to find a good teacher because there are a lot of pranayamas that are very, very, very intense. Again, pranayama means breath work. Um, there in India, we can't take pranayama classes until we've finished the second series and that can take up to 10 years. Um, so you just have to be very, very, very well aware. There's some really intense pranayamas that can at some points called, it's called blindness sometimes. So just be very, very careful when picking a pranayama teacher, make sure the teacher is paying attention to your posture, how you're tucking your chin in with that jaw and dara bunda, all that kind of stuff. All right. As the light and heat moves upward, it passes through the center of the chalices between the two serpents up to the crown of the head. From here, a most remarkable phenomenon occurs. The left side of the crown, an energy descends that is liquid-like in its nature. This liquid is called the red serpentine drops. From the right side of the crown, another liquid-like energy moves down into the chalice called the white serpentine drops. It is the heat and light of the internal raw that causes the crown to secrete these substances. The red serpentine drops are related to the biological mother of the initiative. The white serpentine drops are related to the father of the initiate. As the two mix together, several things occur. There could be a sensation of a sweet taste in the back of the throat, what the yogis and yoginis called Amrita, but which we call in the Isis cult referred to as the spring water, for they seem to come through the springs within the head. Sometimes this is the first presentation, and if initiate focus upon the sensation of the spring waters, a kind of ecstasy arises. Sometimes the initiate senses the light in their head. Again, if they focus upon this light, a kind of ecstasy arises. Sometimes as the red and white serpentine drops mix, there's a spontaneous arising of ecstasy. This ecstasy, no matter what caused it, is crucial to this alchemy. For ecstasy is food and nourishment to the Ka body. There is a tendency for this ecstasy to remain in the higher centers, since this is where they were birthed in the, this practice. But in this method, upon the first arising of ecstasy, the initiate must shift his or her awareness to the entire ka, ka body itself. This causes the ecstasy to spread throughout the entire physical body, shot, and then absorbed by the ka, strengthening and revitalizing it. This is the basic fundamental practice. For those in partnership practicing this magic of is Isis, the ecstasy states naturally arise. For those in solitary practice, the ecstasy, the ecstasy must be self-generated. Both practices, however, require that the initiate become aware of the ka during moments of ecstasy so that the ka body can partake of the rich magnetic fields created by such bliss. Section 22. In the very real sense, the male initiate faces the greatest challenges in the practice of this magic of Isis for it requires that he seemingly go against his own nature. By nature, the male is electric from the alchemical standpoint, while the female is magnetic. That makes sense. Magnet is pulling to, pulling in, right? It is a nature of electricity to move and to act, while in its nature of magnetics is to nest and fold. In the practice, the focus becomes the strengthening of the Ka body, through the incorporation of magnetic fields released by the act. Right after orgasm, the magnetic field generated by the female initiate continues to unspiral and circulate. This is a time to rest and be with the magnetics, but by nature, males tend to either get up and do something or go to sleep. So the male initiate must train himself to nest, to allow the magnetics 
that have been created to spiral into his car and his body. This is different from what occurs normally. For in the male, orgasm is confined to the pelvic area. In some cases, it spreads. But for the female initiate, especially one who has been able to relax into the experience, the orgasm spreads through the entire body and can continue in various levels of intensity for several hours. Wow. Some male initiates might be concerned that by changing themselves, by nesting, they will become less, less masculine, but I can assure you that nothing can be further from the truth. But the truth is that the male initiate nest in the magnetics, his ka body becomes stronger and his sexual energy becomes more potent. One of the tasks for the male initiate is to sensitize himself to new levels of feeling so that he can incorporate the magnetic field released through sex into his own body and ka. To clarify the term nesting, it does not mean the male's member remain inside the female necessarily. It does mean that the male remain close to the female, touching, stroking, being with physical sensations and the emotions after orgasm. It is through the portal of nesting that the male initiate is able to enter the, female, the feminine mysteries of creation. Another aspect the male initiate needs to be aware of is what is called, it's called the adoration of the beloved. As the alchemy of the sex magic becomes stronger, there are certain signs that occur. One of these is that the beloved becomes adored or cherished. This happens both for the male and female initiate. When adoration of the beloved occurs from both partners, the alchemy and sex magic greatly intensifies for the harmonics and magnetics created by such emotions are beneficial to the magic. Totally get that. Totally get that. Number 23. I would like to speak to the term magic at this time. The reason the term magic is used refers to the transformation of the individual human into God. This is indeed magnet. It is symbolized by the God Horus, part man, part hawk. And through the practices of alchemy is raised to the status of a high God Horus, meaning one that has attained the most elevated states of consciousness. So in yoga, we call this Samadhi with a capital S Samadhi, where you're totally one with source, with God. So the magic of Isis is precisely a method for the elevation of consciousness, which is in itself magic. And this is done through the energies and ecstasy created through sex. The other reason the term magic is used is that there are methods. Once the Ka body is potenized, that one can be used to affect one's reality in a very direct ways and methods that seem magical. Take, for instance, the basic core practices of the alchemies of Horus, the raising of the black and gold serpents up the spine, the creation of the chalice, the activation of the internal fire of Ra, and the meeting of the red and white serpentine drops are all acts of magic, acts of intent in both personal and spiritual will. This is why it is referred to as magic. Returning to the paradox facing the male initiate, we find that his nature works against him to create extent in these practices, specifically the sex magic. For once a male initiate's ka is charged, he by nature wants to act, to do something. Yet if he can discipline himself, train himself to continually lying with his beloved, he can nest himself in the rich magnetics created through their love, their sex, and strengthening the ka to a greater extent. Section 24. There is another aspect facing the male initiate in this process, and it has to do with what we in the temple refer to as the obstacles to flight, but which in your language is best stated as psychological issues. <laughs> the term obstacles to flight refers to hindrances to the unfolding of one's porous nature the aspects specifically that can fly upward into elevated states of consciousness. There are attitudes, beliefs, and emotional habits that are counterproductive to flight or the elevation of consciousness, which is what we refer to when we say the obstacles to flight. It is here for the male initiative that one of the most interactive passages require, requiring great skills occurs. As a child, the male was carried by his mother in her womb and protected and nurtured by his mother in his infancy into a point where he had autonomy and could act for himself. At this point, the male child pushes the mother away, so to speak, in order to face the world. 
It is at this ju juncture in his development that he may feel confined or limited by his mother, and a battle of wills can ensue. As a man, as a male initiate, he may still carry these emotional habits with him. In this case, he will find it difficult to relax into the nesting of the magnetic field, since at a psychological level, it is experiencing as surrendering to the feminine. If the male initiate has issues with his mother of childhood, he may engage these consciously or unconsciously with his partner. So basically, dudes, if you got mommy issues, deal with them before you take on a serious partner, because you're just going to project those onto your girlfriend or your wife. And I could probably say the same about women with their daddy issues too. So, all right. Basically, Mary Magdalene just called us all out for our mommy issues and our daddy issues. All right. Section 25. It is important for both initiates to under and undertaking the magic of ISIS to realize that they are embarking on a long journey, that the process is essentially one of alchemy. The purpose of alchemy is to transform one substance into another. It does this by burning off the dross or the negativity of substance so that the pure substance remains and is created. We talk about the burning off in yoga a lot, the tapas, the burning of the old to create the new. In the process of the, of the magic of Isis, the substance transformed are literally the sexual fluids, hormones, neurotransmitters, and other substances not yet discovered by your science. But it also involves a transformation of one's psychology. By nature, the magic of Isis steps up the alchemical process. The heat gets turned up, so to speak. The drosh becomes clear. That which needs to be purified comes painfully into focus. Exactly. You know, a cycle, that's what we see in the um, physical practice of yoga. Why people get triggered a lot. It's because it's showing you your shadow work. It's like, that's why sweat. That's why we, we get hot and sweaty too. It's, it's to show us the impurities. It's like when you clean gold, as my teacher often says, if you want to clean gold, you have to boil it. And when you boil it, the impurities come to the top so you can wipe them away. Same thing. Again, in yoga, we call that tapas. All right. If one does not understand that this is one of the byproducts of alchemy, one might be disturbed by the arising of difficult psychological material. But actually, this is one of the results for the internal pressure created through the intense alchemy generated through the magic of Isis causes the Ka body to extrude or press out of itself all the impurities and to clear itself of, of all the obstacles to flight. In those practices alone, without a partner, the alchemies of Horus also create internal pressures, extruding impurities, but the task is more difficult and the energy required comes from one's own personal effort and there is not the benefit of reflection from another. However, it can be done. Section 26. This is the basic understanding required for the practice of the magic of Isis. In the previous page, pages, I have revealed to you the secrets of the ages, one of the most closely guarded secrets of the temple of Isis. Understanding of these practices was reserved for the most advanced students. Whether one practices the solidari solidarity path through the alchemies of force or the path of sacred relationship through the magic of Isis, one is stepping upon the road to God. The central key in this journey is the strengthening of the Ka through the ecstatic state of consciousness. Whether self-generated or created through ecstasy of sex does not inherently matter. The Ka is nurtured and potentized by ecstatic states regardless of their source. On the contrary, shame is a poison to the Ka body, a toxic element that decreases its vitality and potency. I, an initiate of Isis, find it tragic that the church has shamed women and men around their sexual nature and closed a door on one of the most direct paths to God. Whatever you do along this path, my advice is to free yourself of all the shame. 100%, but we know the church is part of the, the controllers, the dark club. And so they're going to do anything to try to, to cut you off from God. And so makes sense. Search out the catacombs of your own mind and heart. Speak out the dark places in yourself where shame resides and remove it. Find every opportunity to create ecstasy, for it strengthens you and potentizes the cop. Many obstacles to your flight will be few, and the blessings along your journey will be many. Section 27. I wish to turn my attention now to some of those threads concerning the practice of alchemy and the magic of Isis. For the male initiate, 
it is essential to understand that it is the magnetic field created first by the touching and stroking of the female initiate, his beloved, beloved, that starts the cascade of magnetic field, building an intensity to the point of orgasm. It is important that the male initiate train himself to be able to nest in the magnetic field. It is extremely important to both initiates to place their attention on the Ka body during the ecstatic states of consciousness that are generated by their lovemaking, for this strengthens and potenizes the Ka body. And this is essential for this type of alchemy, as was practiced by I and Yashua. At the moment of physical orgasm, there is a tendency for the magnetic surge to move either up through the top of the head or down through the feet. But in either case, this magnetic field exits the body and dissipates. It is important during the moment of orgasm to, to contain the magnetic field or surge. Ideally, the initiate would place his, his awareness in the upper throne of the upper brain center. This would cause the surge of orgasm to rise up to the head, sending its energy into the brain itself and into the ka body. Section 28. There are times when the male initiate may wish to hold back his seed. Within the magic of Isis, male initiates were taught to a specific practice called stopping the lower Nile. From the initi initiatory knowledge of ancient Egypt, the Nile exists both externally and internally. The external Nile being the physical river and the internal Nile being the jet as it flows through the seven seals or chakras. At the moment of physical orgasm, when a man ejaculates, the creative powers that have descended from the upper Nile into the lower Nile are released. This female carries great potential for creating magnetic fields in the form of a new life or an alchemical reaction in the womb of the female initiate, as we discussed earlier. At times, however, a male initiate may wish to hold a seed, primarily because, depending upon his vitality, ejaculation may actually decrease his energy. And it is for these times that the technique of stopping the lower Nile was developed. The male places a finger over the prostate just in front so that at the moment of ejaculation, the semen goes back in, instead of forward. And the magnetic field of his sexual essence recirculates through his body and his ka. But even in these moments, there are magnetic fields gener generated by his ka, which interact with those of the female initiate, and they can both nest within these interactions. Just gonna have to take your word for it, men. I'm just gonna have to take your word for it. I am not in a male body, so don't know anything about that. So, all right, section 29. Oh, and I think I, as I've learned with like my Akashic records and my, um, because I am a split soul, because I do have a divine masculine and I'm a twin, um, since that happened, I've been female in like every life. So, yeah, I know nothing about the prostate. So, <laughs> So men, you're just going to have to like figure that out by yourself because I can't help you with that. Um, 29. And now I wish to address a relatively rare form of partnership, which sometimes occurs within the initiates of ISIS. You would call this same sex partners. All right. So we're going to get into same sex partners, which, which is, is, I mean, for me, I, I know that a lot of people have different feelings about, about homosexuality versus heterosexuality. I believe that homosexuality is how you're born. I, I don't see anything wrong with it. My very best friend is gay. I nothing wrong with it. I myself am 100% straight. I am very much. I like men. I like men. Um, but yeah, so I'm glad she's bringing this up because the church wants to tell us that that too is a sin and it, it's not, it's not a sin. All right. While the building of the magnetic fields and the nesting in these fields and the arising of the ecstatic states can be created through same-sex partners. The interaction of semen in the womb does not occur. So this aspect of the alchemy is not present. However, all the aspects of the alchemy and the magic are relevant. Section 30. Finally, I wish to turn my attention to the term initiate, for I have used this term extensively throughout this material. The term initiate refers to one who has decided to live upward in consciousness, who has decided to leave behind the mundane life and enter into an adventure of consciousness. Generally speaking, the crossing of the threshold from mundane to sacred life is marked by a ritual of initiation. In the ancient practices, a candidate could be initiated by a priest or a priestess, and this priest or priestess would have the power to confer upon the individual the relatively active power of the lineage to which they belong. In this certain type of transition, an external initiator is needed or required. 
However, for the beginning phase, it is possible for a person to initiate themselves for the true essence of initiation means to mark a threshold, the crossing from mundane life into sacred life. For those who feel drawn to practice the alchemies of Horus and who wish to mark their commitment to living a sacred life, I offer this simple ritual. I give this instruction because there is such a, a scarcity of qualified persons to conduct initiations into the ancient lineages of Egypt. For this ritual, one would need a candle and two glasses or cups. One cup is filled with water and the other is empty. If you wish, you could add flowers and incense, making the ritual as aesthetically pleasing as you desire. But fundamentally, self-initiation is an act of initiation and personal and spiritual will. The ritual is simple. The ritual is simply an external reflection of something that is occurring deep within oneself. And indeed, this internal choice can be made without the need for an external ritual at all. For the ritual without internal choice is worthless. For this ritual, you would light the candle and speak these words. Spirit of all life, be my witness here. For the sake of my own elevation and the elevation of all life, I shall strive to be harmless to myself and all others. Then holding the glass or container of water in the right hand, you would pour the water into the container or the glass in the left hand. And by these words, you would seal this action. By the pouring of this water, I signify the transfer of my sacred waters of life from the mundane to the sacred spirit of all life. By my witness here, amen, amen, amen. Section 31. I wish to end my story with thoughts about my beloved Yahshua. As an initiate of Isis, I have been trained for the moment when I met him. And from the moment our, our eyes met, I was transported into other worlds. I understood the teachings that had been obscure. I understood the de deepest secrets of Isis as she revealed them to me, not through the sacred writings, but through the living presence of my beloved Yahshua. As the alchemies were between us intensified, I came to adore him and he me. It was a great difficult for, difficulty for him to part from me. There were stirrings within, in him that longed to be with me rather than to face the death initiations of Horus. Yet as the master soul, he had come to lay a trail of light through the dark realms of death. He did this for his own sake, and for the sake of all mankind. There are many who misunderstand what he did and why he did it. There are those who believe that what they will need to believe in him and no effort on their part is required. Yes, I agree. Yes, that makes me very mad. Yahshua, Jesus cannot pay for your karma. Your karma is your work. You got to do the work. Even though I don't actually believe he was crucified. All right. This was never Yahshua's belief or understanding. He came to be a shower of light, a beacon of love at a time when the world was still in the shadow of a jealous God. Yahshua, as a master soul, demonstrated immense courage and strength to teach love at such a time. It was odd for me, being both the initiate and the woman in love, for I understood that my task was to assist him to build his ka in order that he could face the realms of death with greater power. As an initiate, I understood my task. To some extent, I understood what Yahshua's vision was. But as the woman in love, I was swept away by my feelings for my beloved. And so I stand in time, looking back, as it were, upon our life together. And it is a bittersweet taste. The sweetness of Yahshua's presence will for always fill and sustain me. Yet the bitterness of our parting will always be there as well. In my last days upon this earth, Yahshua came to me again in his calm body, as he had done so for many years. He was with me as I took my last breath, and he took my car through the realms of death, through the trail of light that he had lain through the power of his intention, and took me into what you would call heaven, but it is a place in the soul. I rest in this place with his presence through all time and space. Section 32. I was content to remain here with his essence that I carry in my heart and my mind, but Isis herself came to me and said that now I must tell my story. The lies of the last 2,000 years must come out and come to an end. The feminine is returning to balance to the male. That the cosmic mother is revealing herself at the beginning of the ending of time. And so it is that I reveal one of the lost secrets of the ages. That spirit, the male principle, in order to return to itself through its journey to the master, 
requires the assistance of the female principle, the intelligence of matter itself. But from the solar light filled perspective of the masculine principle, the female principle carries within her a dark, moist and dangerous abyss. The solar principle feels threatened by the darkness of the lunar aspect. Yes, because men are chronic, which is the solar and women are uponic. We talked about that a few episodes ago, which is the moon. Chronic is also upward rising energy or the inhale. Upana is also downward energy or the exhale. The solar principle feels threatened by the darkness of the lunar aspect, but in this joining of the sun and the moon, the joining of the masculine and female principles and equilibrium and energetic balance, that true illumination is attained. When Yahshua pre prepared himself with me for his ordeal before the Garden of Gethsemane, I was the embodiment of Isis. I was she. There was no difference between her and myself. I'd been trained in the practices that would ensure this. And so Yahshua as the sun, the solar principle manifests in the realm of matter, joined with me, the moon, and he was joined with Isis herself. And his elevation could not have occurred without her. She is the cosmic mother. Other cultures call her by other names, but she is the same. To the extent that the male initiate is able to nest into the magnetic fields with his beloved and draw into himself the vibrational energies of these magnetics, to this extent, he is making contact with Isaac herself, the cosmic mother, the cretex of time and space. To the extent that the female initiate is able to surrender to the magnetics and the letting go into her own nature, she becomes Isis herself. When these two events occur at the cosmological level, the male initiate becomes energetically attuned to Osiris and the female initiate becomes attuned to Isis. And out of the commingling of their magnetic fields, Horus is born, except that Horus in this case does not take the form as a child. Horus takes form and Horus takes flight within the Ka bodies of the initiates themselves. They are raised up in a very real manner. They can take flight within the celestial realms of their own being. The truth is that Osiris cannot rise without Isis, nor Isis without Osiris. The high god Horus is birthed from the magnetics of their joining. Makes sense. The male initiate, being electric by nature, thinks that he can make it happen by himself, but he cannot. Isis waits for him to recognize this, but he does not. For centuries she has waited, and now we are at the beginning of the ending of time, and the pressure is strong. This is one of the reasons I have come forward. To those male initiates able to find the pathways in themselves to surrender to the Isis powers carried within the natures of their beloved, or carried within their own natures if practicing a solitary path, know that you do not do this just for yourselves, but for all mankind. When one understands the magic of Isis, it is not possible to do this just for oneself, for the practices quickly elevate the initiate into the level of the living myth, where it is the highest expression, as we have indicated before. The male initiate becomes Osiris himself, and the female initiate becomes Isis, and Horus is birthed out of their magnetics. For those engaged in the solitary practice of alchemy, this is accomplished through the magnetics of the lunar and solar circuits as the basic practice shared earlier is mastered. The black serpent of the moon holding the essence of the void quivers and shakes within the ka body of the initiate, much like the female initiate quivers and shakes within the arms of the male when practicing sex magic. When the, within the initiation practice, the solidary way to the golden serpent of the sun meets the black serpent of the moon in the center of the head and the magnetic field created by their commingling and the energetic reactions created by their in intersections, the chakras or the seals, creates the Horus. So whether it is done alone or with another does not instrumentally matter, but what must occur in both is the same. The sun and the moon must be in balance. And then the illumination we can call Horus occurs. Section 33. I have offered you my story and the teachings that I have been given in the deepest hopes that you will find a passage into your own greatness, for that is what this world needs now more than ever. It is my hope that you will be uplifted by my insights and that you will be inspired as I was by the magnificent being you call Yahshua, but that I call my beloved.
to those who have the courage to practice the alchemies of Horus, and for those who choose to live in a sacred relationship with themselves or with another, I give my blessing. May the blessings of the Cosmic Mother follow you upon your journey to yourself. May the path between the sun and the moon be revealed. Spirit of all life, bear witness. Amen. Signed, Mary Magdalene.